if you don't connect graphically, you've got one hand tied behind your back. I mean, if you're going to use paper or pine, heaven help you. That's not, not a good idea. Um, so, let's see. I see a light. That's very strange. How can I see a light? The obvious, you have to connect the laptop to the display. <laughs> Minor detail. Shade. <laughs> really. What's wrong? What's wrong with this laptop? How else we get the signal? Shade. License activation pay particular attention to this. However, there are easier ways to do things, and one of the suggested ways is you can use something like text wrangler. So again, this is for a Mac, but I'm sure there's something very similar you can get yeah, Windows. What you can do when this starts off, this is a test step. You can file open from FTP SFTP server. Now, you will want to make sure that you check SFTP. If you don't, you're going to have problems. It will not allow a standard FTP connection. So this is a free program for Mac. I'm sure there's something very similar for Windows. Alternately, you can connect to Rogan using XMIN32 or console window. And then you can run an editor like it will open on the terminal and give you Line numbers, syntax highlighting, and so on. Okay. You get syntax highlighting, line numbers, and so on. You follow them this way. So how you want to work this out to you? Just I'm going to caution you that you don't want to. Excuse me. Not put the code on the other, so wait till the very last minute to try to pull it because it will not turn out well. Are there any questions? 
there any questions? Also, it's not just windows that won't work, but it will not work in a robot So if you put the files on your own hand and you want to move them to another machine. So these are very specific to a single machine, a <coughs> single type of machine. One of the problems with Rohan is they always were really, really old. The compilers mm -hmm. were like, five years out of date. With that or that's not the case. They're up to date and they're very new. So they're not compatible between Rohan and Linux. All right. So again, if you don't have a class account, email me. I will get you one. If you're not part of a group yet, or programming in teams, send me an email and I will give you a group. So, it's very much like Java, in fact, Java copied, the you know, Java designers copied C++ put it together when they started that language. But there are some differences. So we have different kinds of file resources. .h Your classes and function proto classes in header files. Dot CPP is the source code file. And it has a main method. Now there are different naming conventions. You will see different ways this is done. This is how I want you to. CC is the source code, and this is the class implementation. So I want you to use those extensions. And you will see, if you click around, CXX, HXX, and so on. But I want you to use these three. So if H has, is the header file, CPP is a file with the main method. And finally, the .cc is the implementation of the class. So in Java, if you have a class, you have one file. In C++, you have two. You have two files uh, for every class. Mm. OK, so again, it's very much like Java the syntax, which is kind of nice. So let's write a simple program on the board and talk about the First of all, we have pound sign. Pound sign include. And then the various classes. Pound sign is a preprocessor, a macro directory. It pulls that file in, include IO stream. So IO stream is the standard input output uh, classes for C. These are, as I said, imports or includes. If you have your own, then you don't use the angle bracket to put in quotes. So, for instance, you might have something that looks like this. Well, the file parts are your fault. You wrote that. The IO stream is a system wide installation, that's the base package for C. But the input is the same. Anything with a pound sign in front of it is a macro directory or a macro preprocessor directory. Then we would have using namespace. <coughs> S -E -D. 
gives you namespace standards. So namespaces are a lot like packages. A lot like packages. If this was Java, you would say uh, package default. Well, of course, you wouldn't say package default. It is by default. You wouldn't say that. But namespace standard, this gives a qualification so that you do not have to put class names on certain things. In Java, you have to do system.out. If you include the standard, that's the basic idea. So you can just name methods without doing the system. You can just do printing. Of course, that's not what it's called in C++, but that's the idea. Then you have the int name. It's not static, nor is it void. It has a return value. So you should always finish your main method by returning zero. So you do stuff here. Well, let's do a simple program. There we have the simplest possible program. So main is a method that has a return value and you return it zero. Now that can be a little bit confusing because we think of zero as false and one is as, as true. And so it looks like we're returning false, which might mean it didn't work, but that's not the case. You return zero means everything works. So it's a message to the operating system. This program ran its course and is terminating normally. If you return something else, it's an error. So there are different codes that you can use. They're mainly used for system processing, but they're uh, constant. So instead of zero, you can do x That. And they're constants, and that's its success is a zero. So you have different codes that you can see. Again, this is mainly used for systems programming, but it's easier and less confusing to just return to mm -hmm. everything. Questions? Okay. How do you compile this? Well, it's not as simple as Java programming. In fact, we're going to use what are called the make files in this class. A make is a unit utility that's used to direct the compilation of complex programs. Make files can be long and complex, and they can be quite simple. You can bypass this and command or compile it to command line pretty easily. And you do it this way. You type G plus plus. Minus O, that's the lowercase letter O. This is the name of the executable. If you don't do this, then you get an A dot out, which is useless. So, minus O, hello. And then the name of your file, let's say, hello world. So you run this, and if there are no errors, then you end up with an executable that's named hello. So it has no extension on it, just hello. Questions? Pretty straightforward. All right. Yes, the NL is a platform independent token. So it's better. We could have written here at the end. We could have done that. 
but it's not a good idea because there's a different end of line character set with Windows than there is with Unix. Windows has carriage return line feed and Unix just has a line feed. So if instead of doing that, we go ahead and put in L, then it makes it more important. So you should do it that way. Other questions? Okay. Notice how we print things. Two less than operators, yes. Hello, is your name of the executable? Huh? Hello, is my name of the executable? Yes. Hello, world is the file. Hello is the executable. Your executable doesn't have to have the same name as the subscript file. It's not required at all. Also, with Java, you use camel case. Everybody know what we mean when we say camel case? It's classes always start with a capital letter. Variables, the first letter is always lowercase, and the second and succeeding words are uppercase, and you don't use dashes or underscores. So you have things like first name. A class, class, stack. This is not the case with C++. C++ does not follow this convention. So you will not see things like this. What you will see is class, stack, lowercase. You will see first underscore name. Now you're really used to camel case. You might be tempted to use it, but don't. You should follow the conventions in place for the language you're working with. If you don't do that, well, there's only two reasons not to. One is you're a troublemaker, and two is you're clueless. But veteran C++ programmers that are used to operating a certain way will look at that and go, Java program. Hmm. <laughs> Why did we hire this number? So follow the conventions in place for the platform you're working with. Don't capitalize anything. Really, there's no reason to. Okay, so this is a string insertion operator. It's an operator. C out, which means print, send to standard out uh, the following. And then there's a chain of things, and you can chain these as long as you want. So, these are essentially the same thing as the plus operator in Java that does concatenation. Except with this, you create one string and then you send it to the, the monitor. These can be hooked up to different places. So, you're going to have the same operator to print things whether you're writing to a file, to a socket, a network connection, to the screen. You always have this stream operator. So there are two of them. C out, print, and C in. That's the other way. So if we want to say here we want to read something from the keyboard, let's change this program here. Enter We might have written it out because it won't move down if we run it on the same line. And then we have string S. And of course we need to include And now I can say C in and that will read as for the keyboard. We have stream insertion and stream extraction operators to 
print. Nurses do not print. There's some good news. This is very much like Java. Uh, and I'm highlighting basically what's different as opposed to uh, doing a complete review of the whole language because you don't really need that. Okay, types. Types of variables. There are some differences. Integer types. Character, short, int, long. Characters in C and C++ are numbers. We think of, okay, a character. Well, a character is, say, this. Well, what it really is, is it's an integer. In hexadecimal, it's that. You can do arithmetic on it if you want to. So as far as C and C++ are concerned, that is an integer. If you want to print the character, you can do so. But internally, it's just a number like any other. So it is, in fact, an 8-bit integer. So the size for these are 8, 16, 32 and 64. That's the sizes of them. Now there's an operator that you can use to get the size on the platform that you're working with. For instance, if you go on Rohan, a long is 32 bits. In fact, int and long are the same size on Rohan. So there's an operator called size of. You can do something like this if you want to. The size of one is And then it will print the number of bytes that a log takes. So it's 64 bits, which is 8 bytes. Now something different from Java. All of these can be either signed or unsigned. They can be unsigned if you want. So what happens if you have an unsigned number? What's the difference? Would you ever do this? This is legal. Unsigned int x. When would you do that? Yep. If you wanted the program to throw an error and nobody can make it. Well, you won't. It won't overflow. It will never be negative. Yes. It will. So if you have an overflow situation, the program will just run. It won't stop. It won't do anything. The only language I know of that catches overflow is C sharp. Other languages should, but they do not. Um, if you have overflow, it just keeps running. But what's the difference? Well, imagine that we have an 8-bit one. Okay. 
Okay, what's the value of C? I'll give you a hint, it's not 1.8. It's negative 1.8. Now it's 1.8. Okay, why? Everybody get that? You have a bit pattern. You have eight numbers and the zeros are wise. Okay. The way you figure this out, you should know this. If you've forgotten about it, it's pretty simple. How many possibilities are there? Two times two. So you can have two digits. There are four possibilities. They're easy to write down. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Four possibilities. So if you have eight digits, it's two to the eight. You have two fifty-six possible numbers. All good so far? Simple review. So half of them are positive and half of them are negative if you use the standard eight-bit number. Yeah. That's right. No, it goes up to two fifty. Here's about 256, but yes, exactly. You get twice as many numbers. You get twice as many numbers if you declare it unsigned. So you can use 255 to get character if you want to. So when would you do this? Well, one place that becomes immediately obvious, we hope, is loop four. You're not used to writing four unsigned in But when we start using the standard template library, you're going to get scads of error messages and warnings that you do not. So it's a good practice. Well, you're going to count up to a certain number and stop. Should I ever be negative? something really weird there. And if you're doing something like addressing an array in here, can that ever be negative? <coughs> Not unless you're using Fortran. No, we can't be negative. Right? So this is a place where it makes no sense to include negative numbers. They're not necessary. And if you go ahead and declare it unsigned, you've got twice as many of them. Um, so if you're using i, and half of the values for i are negative, but I can, I can never be negative, does that make any sense? It doesn't really. Now, unfortunately, Java only has signed numbers. Java does not have unsigned numbers. So you can tap unsigned in front of any of these. And it used to be, it seems to have fallen away now, that you can do Well, on Edoras, a long long is the same size as a long. On Rohan, it's not. And Rohan's twice as big because they have long in the same size. If you have a 64-bit imager on Rohan, you say long, long. So with that risk, it's not necessary. Unsigned long. Okay. Float double, long double. And these are floating points that we don't care about. Float. 
Casting is weird. You can do it the way you know how to do it, but you shouldn't. You have to get error messages in the front platform. So the right way to do it is this. Double. So now, D is 2.0. So use that static cast, and this is the type you're casting to. So save the cast, and just put in the type in parentheses. Enumerations. So what these are, they're just an alias. So you actually have zero through six is how they're created. The reason to do this is you could say or So it makes sense you're going to run your loop from Sunday to Saturday. This was added to Java later, it exists. People don't use it so much. We also have type depth. Now this gets used a lot. This is used quite a bit. The simplest form of this to show you. Later on, when we have more complex structures, this will make sense to you. And so I'll make you aware of it. Okay, the operators are the same in both languages Java and C, C. However, there are two big ones here. Star and the ampersand. Now, unfortunately, this is a situation where the same token or the same symbol is used for more than one thing. What is that called? Overloading. The 
same simple command we use on things. Java doesn't allow overloading of operators, except they've overloaded the plus. The plus is overloaded in Java. It's the only one I think of. Two plus three, a plus c. And they do the same thing, don't they? First one adds, the second one concatenates. A and B is not A plus B. They concatenate the string for other things it adds. So the star or asterisk, of course, is multiplication. Two times three, two star three, that's multiplication. The ampersand, this is the bitwise AND. Everybody know what bitwise AND is? <coughs> you, you know this symbol. Double ampersand. If A is greater than B and A is greater than zero, that kind of thing. Okay, it's the same idea. The single ampersand, however, is a bitwise. So, what's 5 and 7? What does that equal? 5 and 7. Well, it's not addition. It's a bitwise operator. It's not the same as 5 plus 7. It's 5. any zero, it's not. Therefore, one and one is one, zero, four is zero. Five and seven is five. Right? And then it's a bit like or. A lot of times students aren't very aware of these and know what they do. But you're going to need these bit nets later in this class. Okay, five or seven. Well, or is true if anything, if any one of them is true. So five or seven is seven. Is it with me? Okay. It's sort of a digression, actually. So those exist. They exist in Java in the same form. And now in C++, we have another purpose for this. So this is a dereference. It dereferences a pointer. And this gives us the address of any variable. So we get a pointer to anything, or an address to anything. So these are opposites. If x equals t. Not so bad, that's obvious. So star y means declare a variable or type pointers to an integer. Declare a variable of type pointer. Now notice these are used for very different things. When you're declaring this, this star is not a dereference, it's the type. This is a pointer to an integer. And what's the pointer? Well, it's the address of x. So now, if I print y, what do I get? This is the address of the x. The address of x. Okay, what if I put a star in? That's the D reference. Now I get two. Now I get two. So when these are declared, we said x equals two. Now 
this is X, and it's got an address. Let's call it A, B, C. Now, I come along and I say Y has the address of X, so it's got A, B, C, and this is Y. And A, B, C, the Y also has an address, let's call this C, D, E. Everything's got an answer. So we can also do this. So all of these are possible. Okay, the first one prints C, D, E. The second one prints A, B, C. And the last one prints 2. This makes sense? The first one. And Y is the address of Y. It prints the address of Y. It prints C, D, E. The second one, Y. Well, what's the content of Y? A, B, C. And the third one, star y, this is the reference. Go to y, find the address there, go there, and print it. The two. So this gives me c, d, e, this gives me a, b, c, and this gives me I don't have this. You can't get the address of anything you want in Java, which you can't hear. So, this turns out to be extremely useful and beneficial for many things, and they're used heavily uh, in C++. Questions so far? All right. Yes. So, uh, you ever say The ampersand is the address of the variable. So rather than y, it's the address of y, which is C, D, E. Alright. Functions behave the same way they do in Java. Uh, not terribly different, except more powerful. So let's consider a scenario here. Java, what does this do? What does this method do in Java? If I invoke this, let's say I have a declaration in my program in x equals 2, y equals 3, and then I call that method and then I print x, and what do I get? 2. I get 2. Swap. And now system out print line. And it prints two. Does everybody understand this? So why didn't it swap? Why didn't it print three? I'm sorry? They are passed by value, i.e., on the stack we put it to in the tree. So when we call swap, we put on the stack. But 
we push the two and the three on the stack. This is not the X and Y in the main program. This is on the system stack. Then we swap them. Then we get the bracket here, and everything's popped off the stack. So we swap something, all right. We swap A2 and A3, but we didn't swap this two and three. We swapped copies of two and three that were, that were pushed onto the stack that we call the swap function. Everybody good? Follow me? Okay, so this is useless. C++. What does that do? So do I have to change? Well, this is not It's not going to plug in C++. So we'll go ahead and say C++. OK, now what is the print? Print. It doesn't mean. Now, do I need to change my syntax here? Do I need to pass in the address of x and y? Because this is not the address of x and y. And the answer is no, I don't. Because of the prototype. This is all you have to do to make it work. The ampersand. Because it becomes a reference. It's a reference. Now you can also do this, this way. Not recommend, kind of a pain. So this is a pointer to an integer, a pointer to an integer. So now we have to say int equals star a, star a equals star b, star b equals m, and then swap. Now, for that C, that's the C style sheet. The C plus plus style is you simply put the ampersand in the function prototype, and you don't have to do anything else, and it works. So just X, Y, no star, not no. And here, ampersand. So the ampersand is used for yet one more thing, and that is references. And a. Notice the ampersand is on the left hand side of the equals. It's on the left hand side of the equals. So this is now an alias for B. If I say R equals 4. What do I get? I get four. So this is a reference, not a pointer. So the ampersand is used to get the address of something. It's also used to create an alias, and these aliases exist in this form. And notice this the ampersand is on the left hand side. So if I'm just going to create a pointer, I'll do something like this. Here. Star Q with N and R, and that declares a reference. It's an alias to that. Well, doing something like this is maybe a contrived example because why would you ever use R if you got P? It's pointless. So there's one big flex this is used, and it is. 
So we have the big difference here in how we call a remote function. We've got call by reference and call by value. So the difference between these two is important. And you have no control over this in Java. Objects are what they are. If it's a reference, you're passing it by reference. If it's not a reference, you're passing it by value. And you have no choice. In C++, you have complete choice. You can pass the same thing both ways if you want to. So what's the difference between passing a parameter to a subroutine by value versus by reference? What's the difference? Yes? Pass it by reference if you wanted to operate on it, and by value if you wanted to use it to create something new. Did we talk about that? Uh, a little, but you're on the right track. You're on the right track, but you're not quite Let's be precise. By reference is you pass in the address of the variable. By value, you pass in a copy of the variable. That's the difference. So consider, oh, did I write some more? All right. We're going to redo this just quickly. We have a variable. Let's call it. All right, so P has two. We've got N2. P equals two. There it is. All right. Well, this variable has an address in memory where it lives. So let's say this address is ABC. So when I call a subroutine with this parameter, I have a choice. Do I pass into the subroutine the value 2 or the reference ABC? That's the difference. Okay, so consider over here, I'm in my subroutine, I'm in my method. Over here. So I take my parameter, let's say it's R. It's it's an R. Okay. So if I say R equals 4, what does it change? Well, look at the stack. In the first case, what I have passed in is 2. So I change this 2 to 4, and what does it do to P? Nothing. This is a copy. This is a copy. There are now two twos. One in main memory here. And one on the stack here. There's two twos. This one gets set to four. Well, what the hell did that do to P? Nothing. Absolutely zero. Has no effect. All right. The other scenario, I pass by reference. By reference. A B C. Put the address of P on the stack. And over here, I dereference it. Star R equals 4. Okay, what does that do? That says go to ABC. That address. Go to ABC and change the contents in memory at ABC. That changes P. Am I with me? Have I confused you? Again, yeah. one changes stuff in the actual address and one only changes it in the stack. That's right. That's exactly right. So now we have a copy of the address, which you can dereference to change the original. But if you just have a copy of the two, then you change the copy of the two. And that does nothing to the original. Yes. 
Well, this is a pointer, and the ampersand, ampersand is a reference. So if we had done this, we wouldn't need the star here. And I wanted to emphasize that it's being the reference. So there are two complete different ways to do this in C++. This is the way it's usually done. You put the ampersand because it relieves you of the need to dereference things all over the place. It automatically is. Yes. Is the diagram on the left the same? You put the ampersand in? Okay. Yes. Okay. It's true. So the default behavior of Java is which one? When do we have parameters? called by reference in Java. Yes. And every time it's an object, you have no choice. Therefore, if the parameter is an int, it's by value. If it's an object, it's by reference. You don't have a choice. There is no choice. Well, C++ is a much more powerful language than Java is. You have a lot of features in this language. It's a bigger language. There's more stuff. It's also possible to hang yourself with this language very easily, so you want to be careful. So understanding pointers is critical, and I can tell you now that there will be some very pointed questions on the first exam to see if you get this notion. The implications are complex, but the idea is simple. A variable either holds a value or it holds an address where that value is. So that's it. That's the whole ballgame. It's either a value or it's the address of where that value can be found. Yes? Um, if you had it, we're using the other place with the asterisk, would you, and you put it in the top, but you forgot to put it in the bottom, would you effectively be trying to change the address? Yeah, it pro the compiler probably won't let you do this, but I erased the asterisk. You need to do this if you're using pointers. Star R is a pointer to an integer. If you want to dereference it, you have to do this. If you do R equals 4, then you're trying to set the address here to 4. The compiler will say, no, wait a minute. That's an address, not a value. Don't do that. They're getting better. They never used to complain. They let you do it. So then you go to address board, and Lord knows what you find there, and you crash and burn. Okay. So, understand this difference. Now, by reference, is much more common, and it's more efficient. Imagine you have an array of size 1 million. In Java, if you pass that array into a function, you pass the very small address, not the million elements. However, at C++, you can pass the million elements if you want to. You can pass by value or by reference. You have the choice. And you obviously do not want to push a million array elements onto a stack. There's no reason to Therefore, there's a keyword that we want to use when we're passing by reference, and we don't modify things. We just want to read them. And so it would look like this. You would say void to constant int and x. And that means that you can't change what x points to. You can only read it. It makes it read only. This is safer code. Questions? Okay. We will see more of this later. Along the idea here of pointers, I want to point out a common mistake and make sure that you're aware. Star in what's wrong with this? Or is it okay? 
Yes. Star in equals two. Well, the star in is a declaration of a point in time. And so, what's wrong with this account? I think there's something wrong with it. <laughs> it should be start in two, right? Well, it looks okay. And that's why I put it up here to make a big deal out of it. Because some of you may do this, and if you do, it's a disaster. It says, go to where n points and put a 2 in memory at that location. Well, where does n point? Well, who knows? Now, in Java, when you declare variables, there are, in many cases, initialized. There are rules for that. But if you declare an integer in Java, it's zeroed out. If you declare an object, it's null. In C++, you get whatever's left over in memory. So you will get a chunk of memory on the stack for n. This is n. But guess what? It's going to have something in it. And you don't know what's in it. Maybe that was part of a picture. It was a snippet of a sound clip. Uh, who knows what it was? Somebody else's program before you started running. There's something in memory there. You don't know what it is. But it's taken as an address. So that says go to the number in the end, whatever it is, go there and put a 2 in memory at that location. So the best case scenario is you crash immediately. The worst case scenario is your program just runs. But you've corrupted your own memory somewhere. If that memory belongs to somebody else, because who knows what number it might be? If that memory belongs to somebody else, then you just get a segmentation fault and you will crash. What is a segmentation fault? If you're going to see this, you should know what it is. What is a segmentation fault? Memory is divided into segments. And if you ask for a segment that does not belong to you, you want to read a memory chunk that does not belong to you, then the operating system will say, well, there, cowboy. <laughs> and it will throw a fault, and your program will crash. You can't look at read that memory. It doesn't belong to you. So an access to an illegal memory location will cause a segmentation fault. You will see these. Trust me. So this is a mistake because you don't know where Moreover, setting it to null does not help, because can you go to null and set it equal to 2? No, you can't. Therefore, this is an error. Notice we've got star n twice here. This was a variable declaration, but this is a dereference. This says create a variable to a pointer to an integer, and while you're at it, make space for this integer. So on the stack, we have n. n has to hold an address. We say new int on the heap. Then we have a chunk of memory that will hold an int. It's not assigned yet. And this is returned. And now this is A, B, C. That's what the first line does. The second line says the reference in. Go to the address in in and start to there. However, if we just say int star n equals 2, then you have an n some number, whatever was left over in memory, 2b4c3918. 
Well, go there and set that memory location to two. Oh dear. All right, so this leads to subtle evil errors that will bite you. So you must not, cannot do that. All right. Okay, not okay. <coughs> I okay. Yeah. That's fine. Yes. Well, what about this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's okay. Notice, however, that arrays are always, always a point. They are in Java as well. When you make a Java array, it's a point. Okay. All right, we're going to stop there. Let's pick this up. Yeah.